This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. Every year in June, the Institute hosts a luncheon in honour and remembrance of the D-Day Dodgers, who fought tremendous grinding battles in Italy before and after June 6, 1944. This year, our speaker was retired Honorary Colonel Jordi Beale of the 48th Highlanders. Voices of Ortona, Christmas 1943. Now, I know you expected the talk to be about Ortona and voices from Ortona, but this is about movie scripts and Herbie's. When I was asked by General Thompson uh, to make a few remarks about the Italian campaign, I agreed with significant trepidation. After all, there are many more qualified here today to speak about it than I. The topic was, at that point, Voices of Christmas or Tonda 1943. And I expect most of you already know the story of Ortona and the Christmas that was held there. This will be my subject but not the way you thought. However, before I get into the story and the surprise behind it, indulge me in a few observations about the Italian campaign. Observations that I've gleaned from two sources. One is quotations of the actual soldiers who were there, many of whom I took over in, 19, in the year 2000 to revisit some of the battlefields. And the other are letters from my father. 1,058 letters that my mother gave me when she turned 90, thinking that since my dad died when I was 15, that I should know something about him. And she had numbered them all from, 1, 000, from 1 to 1,058. Observation 1. Canadians learn, then adapt. The experience of Canadians starting with the landing at Pekino, if you think about it, was as if the training that they had been doing in England was progressing. And each battle they engaged in from Pekino up until Camp Abasso was a little more complex and had one more lesson than the previous one. This learning they quickly translated into new tactics because Canadians learn and they adapt. And by the time they left Camp Abasso to face things like the Gully, Ortona, the Hitler Line, Canadians were honed, experienced, and bloody confident. The 48th veterans I took to Europe to visit the battlefields that they were on said, we don't want to go to Sicily or southern Italy. I asked why. They said, mm, it was too easy. They wanted to see the northern battlefields where the Canadians demonstrated the skills that they had learned and would execute. Observation number two. The Italian campaign and the Canadians' involvement there read like movie scripts. They're larger than life. They're frequently beyond belief but they were the reality of what they did. They would always be on the attack, and the Germans would always occupy the high positions with their weapons carefully sighted on the crossroads and the valleys. So, Canadians traveled by night. And if they didn't have a smothering barrage for an attack, they'd fight at night as well. And mountain cliffs that were too stiff or too steep, and the Germans thought that there was no need to put significant defenses on them, were ideal. And Canadians climbed them. Just ask the HDPs at SRO. Or they would split battalions and send two companies in that direction and two companies in that direction, often with those terrible 26 sets that didn't work worth a darn and coordinate independently an attack from the rear. Surprise, they learned, was one hell of a weapon, as was speed, both of which Canadians learned to use with flair. Observation number three. 
observation three. Voices from the battlefield for me are the most telling. And the most matter of fact, the 48th Highlander veterans that I took over were a source for me, and the other, as I said, were my dad's letters. Now, he died when I, he came home. I was five years old, actually, during it, five years and two weeks old. Dad was overseas. He left when I was 10 weeks old. And he died when I was 15. So I knew Dad as Dad. And I knew he had some army friends, but he didn't make a big deal out of it. It was more exciting the fact that he could get me a uniform to play football in because he couldn't afford a, a uniform at the high school I went to, so he went and got one from uh, Teddy Morris, the trainer of the Toronto Argonauts, where he'd been quarterback. So today, movie scripts and Herbie's is what you're going to hear. The movie script today is set near Rotona in December 43. And the voices I'm going to use, for the major part, I will read. That's why I've got it written here. You can look at the slides, and I will put some words up there that will tend to describe the actions of the battle, but in many cases, I won't repeat the words that are there. So if you can't see the screen from where you are, just pay attention to the voices of the people who were there. So on December 43, the 1st Canadian Division was advancing on Artona, on the Adriatic coast of Italy. Now much has been written about the magnificent performance by the 2nd Brigade in the town of Ortona. The Loyal Eddies, the Sea Force, had every right to be proud of everything they did, and all Canadians should know and glory in their accomplishments. But today is another story, about the same time, but of the 1st Brigade to the West. It's a movie script. And the voices are those Herbies of the 48th Highlanders. Of course I talk about the 48th Highlanders. Those who were there for Christmas 1943. And this, as far as I can reconstruct it using their words, is their Christmas as they told it. The slides I'm going to use, you can read as we go. So as this battle was starting and was engaged, Sergeant Herb Pike, the chap on the right, had a few comments. He said, that's where mouse holding was invented. Remember, it's an ancient town, and the streets weren't boulevards, such as we're used to, and the homes were all joined together, and you couldn't get out on the streets. Snipers would get you. So the fellows would blow a hole. When you cleared a house, you always cleared the top first and worked your way down. So they'd run in and get upstairs. They'd clear that and clear the bottom, and then they'd blow a hole in the next one and do it all over again. So that way, they wouldn't have to fight in the street. When the Battle of North Toronto was well engaged and it looked like it was going to be a long and a messy activity, General Volks decided that the 1st Brigade should be outflanking Ortona. And he had a very simple plan, and the Hasties, Hasting, uh, Hasty Peas would uh, seize the intermediate ground halfway between uh, uh, the start line that they were at in a town called San Tommaso, and the 48th would pass through them and take San Tommaso, and that would cause the Germans to be threatened in terms of the only road that was in and out of Ortona on the coast. Sergeant Herb Pike repeated, Oops. 
We had to go to the left to cut off the main road into Ortona and Pescara. If you cut that road off, Jerry couldn't bring any more reinforcements into Ortona. So we were told to go to the left through these small towns and clear that out and cut the road off. Well, how'd the plan go? Well, the Hastings were intended to seize the intermediate ground and within less than 100 yards they were stopped dead. And the tanks found the mud impossible and they couldn't support it at all. And so after a full day of activity, the plan was put on hold. Volks then decided that the 48th should go unsupported and they should proceed with their half of the battle even though they were still at the start line. Johnson, Colonel Johnson, the commanding officer of the 48th, considered that plan carefully and rejected it. He decided that they would go single file through the German lines at night in the rain, in the dark, for a mile and a half. The comments within the brigade were, quote, good Christ, the glamour boys have gone crazy, close quote. On the way forward, they cleared two houses of paratroopers that they came upon who were either sleeping or getting ready for the Christmas celebrations, and they took them without a sound and sent the German prisoners back to the hasty P lines, again along that same goat path. When Corporal Gord Oakwhite uh, recognized the paratroopers, his comment was, well, they had the crack troops against us all the time. He would say, wherever we went, they moved their best troops the same way. You've got to understand, these were professional people. These Germans were well trained, and the paratroopers were really good soldiers. And we know that because the rest of the German army were conscripts, and volunteers were their best. When they got to their point at night, they quietly dug in. And in the morning, as the Germans were standing on the balconies, because uh, if you know Italian houses back then that are in the farmland, the animals are in the first level and the people live in the second level. So the Germans were in the second level and they came out to the, the balconies that were on top and they were enjoying breakfast. At which time the 48 stood up and laughed at them, which sort of got their attention. And this is what went on during the day. Now, Corporal Gord Othway commented, and that's Gordy in a Charles Comfort photograph, or a painting of the Hitler line. Gord swears to, this, to the day he died that that was him in the center. It does indeed look like him, and he's much stronger, than, was much stronger than I was, so I was never going to argue. Gord said, I was in a gun pit with one of our Bren gunners. And everything was sort of quiet and we could hear the Bren guns popping off because they were not that quick at firing. Then all of a sudden this cheese cutter opened up, which is an MG42. Jerry fires 1,500 rounds a minute and it waves like this up and down. If you happen to be in the up wave, you were all right. If you were in the down, you've had it. He said, I shook for 10 minutes after that and I wasn't even near it. Well, I heard it. It just echoed right in your head. In the morning of Christmas, 
on the 25th of December, the 48th were now ringed by paratroopers, having put in an all-round defense. And on the 24th, the uh, 88s and uh, heavy machine guns had arrived, indicating that uh, they were able to, to move some reinforcements in. But Colonel Johnson decided that they needed to be disrupted a little, and as he said to one of the company commanders, he said, take your company and put a little fear of God and the 48th Highlanders into them. So they launched a couple of lightning bolt attacks. Throughout the day, the sniping continued while the Germans were wondering where the heck they were going to get the troops to deal with this penetration a mile and a half into their lines, because their troops were engaged in Artona. And there was one serious attack uh, near the night. Lieutenant Ian MacDonald, or Lieutenant Jack Pickering, was actually selected as his platoon to be the one that would put the fear of God into the Germans. And Lieutenant MacDonald, who is the one with the binoculars on the left, with the, with the uh, with a platoon, said, Look here, Jack, both platoons should go. One can't do it alone. And when their little foray was over, and Pickering thanked MacDonald, MacDonald said, quote, Hell, if you'd gone along, you wouldn't have got there, so we would have had to follow anyway, close quote. Now at that point, Dad was behind the lines, still with headquarters company, and he wrote a letter to my mother. And it says, this is letter number 678, since he started, since he'd been overseas. It says, the battalion's about a mile from here, but we've been un unable to get to them for 48 hours due to the enemy being between us and them. As I write this letter, the situation is critical, but we will get out of it somehow. I couldn't imagine a worse situation for Christmas Day, but there's no sign of Christmas here. The battalion is fighting for its existence, but we will come through, I know. I've been in touch with them by wireless, but just now communications died as their battery sets have gone dead due to the fact we can't get fresh ones to them. We're now trying to drop them essentials by plane. That afternoon, the RCR were, were directed to close up the gap and to relieve the 48th, and they made it about halfway. And at the same time, German reinforcements arrived, indicating that the Germans had figured out where the heck they were going to get extra trips, the troops. And artillery was being used to fire on the German concentrations on all four sides of the 48th. The Fu, who was Major A. A. Hawker of uh, 226 Field, a British unit, responded when his coordinates questioned his gun gunnery, his, uh, when his coordinates were questioned by his gunners. He said, quote, just keep shooting. Imagine we're an island, close quote. So that night the CO decided to have aggressive night patrols. And here's one such patrol that came from 7th platoon under Lieutenant Bill Hunter. And after the war he wrote me a letter and it says, this group had been on a fighting patrol penetrating the German lines to determine their strength. If lightly held, we were to give them a little punch and capture the position. If heavily defended, we were to back out. So we fired a magazine of tracers so the artillery could locate us. Then we fired a second round of tracers so they could get a better fix on our position. 
They boxed us in. And then they opened the back door so we could pull out. Christmas evening continued on the 25th of December. And at that point, the information officer's Batman, a private by the name of John Crockford, made Christmas cake. His recipe was cornmeal, emergency chocolate rations, powdered milk, and walnuts he borrowed from a local farmhouse. He traced Merry Christmas in the icing with his finger. After the war, a 48th Highlander's wife asked the commanding officer, what made the cake rise? CO's response was, it didn't. <laughs> In letter 682, on the next day, in the morning, Dad wrote, Remember, I told you the battalion was cut off with Germans on all four sides of them. They hadn't had any food for 48 hours, and their ammunition was nearly gone, so we had to do something. Well, that night I took 150 men of the Saskatoon Light Infantry as a carrying party, plus stretchers to carry out the wounded, and I started off. Luckily, it was pitch black. But dear, I was really worried whether or not we could get through. We got through, right through the enemy lines without losing a man or a bit of the essential stuff we were taking in. Ammunition, batteries, and rum. We got out the wounded also, and when I arrived at the battalion at five minutes to midnight on Christmas, boy, dearest, was I Santa Claus. Johnson, did you get all the party through? Captain Beale, uh, no, not yet, sir, but they're coming. I've only got half of them. We started with 150 SLI people, but don't worry, sir, the Padres bringing up the rear. And indeed he was. A quote from an SLI corporal that is, was recorded was, I was so surprised to find that that tall 48th officer was a padre. He stopped being nice and stormed at us like a sergeant major. CO to Captain Beale, quote, you forgot to bring a tank. Tell him, that's Corporal, Corporal, uh, Colonel Spry, the gate CO, to send us just one tank and we'll massacre him. Captain Beale responded, I'll tell him the 48th didn't ask for relief or reinforcements. They want a Sherman for Christmas. Johnston, that's right, one Sherman. As the night continued, Pad Padre East visited each and every one of his boys. And then they left. In the morning, shelling and counter-shelling was the activity. The Germans would shell, the Fu would pick a spot, and they'd be counter-shelled. And at 9.30 in broad daylight, the information officer went back alone to get the tanks they wanted. And at 10 a.m., the Germans began a full assault on Able Company on the left front flank. 226 Field started shelling 100 meters out, and as the Germans drew in closer, they reduced the number of guns, and they kept reducing the number of guns until the last gun that was firing was right on the 48th Highlanders' trenches as they were waiting. Then the last gun stopped, and the fight began. It was hand-to-hand, -hand and if you read the history and you read the discipline, they stayed 
disciplined and cross-protected each other trench to trench. Uh, and after the Germans penetrated actually the headquarters company of Abel Company arose and knocked them back so the Germans retreated and the lines were attacked. Twice more this happened before noon. Then at noon, Clarkson returned with three Ontario tanks. He started out with four, one of them got stuck in the mud somewhere. He was fortunate, as he said, that the first one didn't get stuck because the others could never get past on that little path. And the commanding officer at that point he created a new tank infantry activity that had, hadn't been used before. The tanks would go in first and shoot everything up they could see. Then a full company would assault as the tanks drew aside, and then they would all beat the hell out of there back to their lines. And as the Germans retreated from the assault, the artillery would open on them in the open ground. This continued through the day, and an attack was made not only on Abel Company, but on Dog Company on the other quarter. As the day drew to a close, At 1800 hours, there was a final round of shelling from the German artillery. And then there was silence. A sergeant in Baker Company was quoted as saying, it felt like the end of the war. The contrast was so great, but we soon found out it wasn't, and we just got on with the war. That night they counted the toll. Germans killed, wounded, and captured in one day over 120. 48 Highlanders killed or wounded eight. The Canadian Army, since the day it landed in Sicily, had always been on the assault, and absolutely everyone in the brigade and in the division would say, God, if we could only be on the defense just once, we'd massacre them. And so they did. Because many of the times in the assault, the Canadian Army didn't have the magic three to one that you're supposed to have in assault versus defense. They were lucky to have a little over one to one. But they did it because of the factors that I mentioned at the beginning. At the end of that day, the the second relief party came in. And Dad quoted in letter 683, the following night I took in through the same route with the enemy still there, 135 men with rations plus ammunition plus heavy machine guns, pickers. And now today the situation is cleared up and due to the good work of the 48th, there's a big breakthrough. And the Germans have drawn well back, leaving heavy casualties. We're all proud of the way the regiment did its part. The Padre stayed, and the next day he buried the Germans. They named the site Cemetery Hill. And frankly, it should be called that in the Battle Honors. It isn't, it's called Ortona because that's the district we were in, but it was called Cemetery Hill. The Germans then opened up with 105s and that meant they were leaving, and they did. And at the end of that night, the Germans pulled out of Ortona. And the Loyal Eddies and the Seaforth Highlanders deserve every piece of credit they got for exactly what happened, but the Germans were also threatened by the fact that their road in and out of Ortona was less than 500 yards from the Canadian front line. So we switched from offense 
but from, from defense to offense. And the 3rd Brigade was assigned to attack the Germans and the 48th to clear the two towns of San Tomaso and San Nicola. And if you look at the casualties during that period, casualties in the defense were 20% or less, and casualties in the offense were 80% or higher. So from the 2nd of January to the 8th of January, and we still haven't had Christmas, we were holding in the line and patrolling. And on the 5th of January, they had a sort of Christmas in the lines, and Dad's comment was, in letter 684, the fighting here has lessened in intensity, thank heavens, and we're sort of sitting on our game position. The country's a mess, though, and there's hardly a house left standing for cover. We're going to have Christmas on January the 5th again this year. We wrote this the day before. But this time it'll be right in the front line with the Germans about a thousand yards away. Nice, eh, dear? And then in the very next letter he said, Oh, it's a quiet day today for a change. Tomorrow, everyone's going to have a bath, a change of clothing, a bottle of beer, and their parcels, so morale should rise to great heights. The battalion for the last month has been living with nothing but their battle dress and a gas cape, which isn't much, is it, dear? However, it shows what a tough, tough outfit they are. Everyone's pretty tired and do need a rest badly. Mm. There's a 25-pounder gun going off about 20 yards from the shack I'm riding in, and every time it goes off, half the plaster from the ceiling falls down, so if this form looks a little dirty, that's what it is. Tomorrow, I told you everyone's going to get a bath, and the officers will get a bottle of whiskey. So we'll try to imagine it's Christmas again, although it will be a bit difficult. So on the 9th of January, they were pulled out of the line after 34 days in battle for a rest area near the Ariely River. And I should tell you what this is. Uh, this was one of Dad's platoon commanders uh, drawing a sketch. They handed things around uh, within the unit when they had debates, etc. And there's Dad, who was height challenged, uh, standing on a chair at the back. And Nut Hall was Lieutenant Nut Hall, who had written, uh, who had done the cartoon. And Dad, of course, is saying, "Hey, you guys, sit down in front. I can't see sweet fatty Adams from here. Not all." You got me a rotten position again tonight. So, the Italian campaign was movie scripts and herpes. It was typically Canadian. Finding what worked and doing it better. Dropping what didn't work and getting on with it. Achieving the seemingly impossible and shrugging your shoulders when it was over. Trusting your comrades because they could trust you. Putting people before glory and then going home to Canada to build your country and doing it as a matter of course. The Italian campaign had hundreds and hundreds of movie scripts. Just take three brigades of the 1st Division, for example, of infantry. That's nine battalions, average of 20 battle honors a person, or a, a battalion. That's 180 movie scripts. And those are just the ones for which awards were given. And thousands and thousands of Herbies, just being Canadian, without the recognition of medals, because doing what was right was the Canadian thing. Voices of Christmas was just one such story. I urge you to tell your stories of your regiment's movie scripts and of your regiment's furbies. Canadians deserve to know. Canadians deserve to be proud. Thank you.
This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.